when it comes to screens, one of the things that bothers me is what that often means is it's still this sort of time question. It's often, you know, I keep track of how many hours they're on it. But I want parents on it with the kids when they're little so that the kids learn to imitate mature behaviors online. So they learn to imitate ethical behaviors, not just online, in a digital world so that they learn how to make sense of it. Welcome to Tilt Parenting, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. My name is Debbie Reber, and I'm the host of this show. And today I'm talking with Jordan Shapiro, a PhD who is a world-renowned thought leader on global policy, education, game-based learning, and parenting in the 21st century. Jordan is a senior fellow for the Joan Gantz Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop and non-resident fellow in the Center for Universal Education at the Brookings Institution, and is an international speaker and consultant whose fresh perspective combines psychology, philosophy, and economics in unexpected ways. I wanted to bring Jordan on the podcast after reading an article about his new book, The New Childhood, Raising Kids to Thrive in a Connected World that piqued my interest. It offered a point of view on the role of screens and technology in the lives of children that was in contrast to what we so commonly hear. The new childhood draws on groundbreaking research in economics, psychology, philosophy, and education, and asks readers to consider how technology is guiding humanity toward a bright future in which our children will be able to create new, better models of global citizenship, connection, and community. In our conversation, we talk about the ideas behind his book, what Jordan sees as the biggest problems with the way parents are relating to their children's screen time usage, why he thinks it's important for parents to integrate a child's use of technology and their off-screen life, and much more. Just like Jordan's book, this was a thought-provoking conversation that left me thinking differently about the role of screens and technology in our family. I hope it provides you with some interesting food for thought. Before I get to the interview, I want to give a quick shout out to some new supporters of the podcast, Natalia Bulgari and Heidi Venkamins. I am so grateful for your joining my Patreon campaign and helping me fund this show. If you're listening to this and you enjoy this podcast and would like to support its production, please consider joining Natalia and Heidi by signing up for my Patreon campaign and supporting this show at the five, 10, or even $20 a month level. Every dollar of that money goes directly toward covering the production costs for this show and the operating costs for Tilt Parenting. Thank you so much for considering. If you want to learn more or sign up, just go to patreon.com slash Tilt Parenting and Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Thank you so much. And now here is my conversation with Jordan. Hello, Jordan. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. It's great to be a part of this. Yeah, I'm, uh, I've am i been wanting to have you on the show since I read an article about your new book, The New Childhood. I shared it with my community on Facebook and got some interesting comments. And I just thought, I want to bring you on the show to just have a deeper conversation about the work that you're doing. I think it's pretty relevant to my community. So before we get into that, Can you just take a minute or two to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the work that you do? I can do my best. I mean, I do a ton of things. Um, You know, my background is in psychology and and philosophy, and I sort of accidentally got interested in uh, kids and technology, mostly because I, I, I was observing my own kids and worrying about what was best for them. And I just found myself doing a lot of a lot of writing about video games, about kids and screens, about uh, about play in general, about learning and and, be, and before I knew it, uh, all of all of my my philosophy and psychology background and my research background was was pointed in this direction and 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 you know, maybe we're about 8 years later, uh, there there's a book about it. So <laughs> 
And tell me a little bit just about what you do kind of day to day. You're is it you at Temple University? Yeah, correct? yeah. So day to day I do teach at I do teach at Temple University, uh, uh small small seminars uh, uh in the classroom with with undergraduates, which I love, which is actually not at all connected to uh, the research that I do. Uh, I mean, it certainly connects by happenstance, but it's not um I teach totally different things. Um and I like that because it's like it's another space where I can like not be talking about the same thing all the time. Uh, but then I also do research with the, the Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop and also with the Brookings Institution. I'm, I'm, I'm a fellow at both, both of those organizations doing research in a very broad way. Uh, and I do a lot of consulting with um, internationally, globally around questions of, you know, how's the world changing and how do we and how do we prepare kids for that changing world? That's great. Thank you for that. I want to just go right to the conversation about your book. So you have a book that came out, I believe, in January called The New Childhood, Raising Kids to Thrive in a Connected World. And tell us first, what led you to write this specific book? Um, <laughs> um, I think these were, as I said, these were ideas that I had been playing with for a long time. I had actually been writing about them for a long time, I, I I wrote a column for Forbes for a long time about um about education and 21st century parenting and um and and video games sometimes also I would just write about kids and games uh, all these sort of issues that are new to parents uh, and then and then the time came where I felt like it really needed to be put into a long form and that was how I got to the book but the concern that really drove me uh, more than the the timeline the concern that drove me is you know we're we're moving into a very different time i think for people in general i think that there's huge um changes happening from a technological perspective from an economic perspective from a political perspective from a geopolitical perspective i mean there's so much happening um and, and these moments of transition really um require that that grown-ups put a lot of thought and intention into how we prepare our kids for it um which is hard because at the same time anything that's this big a change is is really uh anxiety provoking because of the uncertainty and the fear and we don't know what to expect and so i i, I really wanted to give parents sort of a vision of the future a way of thinking about the future that that made it less less scary and less confusing um and and that's how that's how the book came to be it, it often gets sort of in in the press it often gets sold as this super pro screen time book that this is the book about why screens are okay um and there certainly is some of that, but but mostly it, the book comes out of a really deep concern that we're not handling screens very well uh, and that we need to think about it as grownups, how we're going to teach our kids to live well with this new connected technology. This is certainly not a book where I'm like, hey, let your kids play video games all day long, all the time, and don't worry about it. But mm -hmm. <laughs> even though people tend to, tend to paint it that way. Well, one of the things, just taking a step back, that I really liked about the work in general, and, and a lot of your work, you know, and things that you've written about education and, and so forth before this book, was that you are encouraging people to take a step back and, and question things, right? And to acknowledge that things are changing. And there are bigger conversations that we need to have. And you talked about that we're moving into a different time. And just to connect it to, to my community, that's very much what what I believe and what my listeners believe in terms of, you know, the one in five or more kids today who are in some way neurologically atypical. And, you know, so I, I like to include them in that conversation, too, that we need to reevaluate really everything yeah. that we thought about education and, you know, and screens and really all aspects of our lives, because we are moving forward. And that can be a great thing if we if we stop clinging to what we think it needs to look like. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the, the I think you, you put that really nicely. That's sort of the core of, uh, of the message of almost everything I do. But I'd add one more point, which is in some ways, I'm also very much a sort of classicist, traditionalist in it. And that I, I don't think that while, while we are going through a transition, that's a change from what we've had for the last 100 years, 150 years, who knows, you know, where you're going to put the exact marker. But 
uh, we're not going through anything that's really new for new for for humans. Humans have gone through huge transitions many, many, many times, uh, and there's a lot we can learn from history and from the past and from a lot of a lot of the old stuff. So, so I think part of what what makes my position really different than a lot of other people is that it's so grounded in 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 old wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, wisdom even older than 20th century. Uh, you know, I, I sort of see the 20th century and the industrial era as as a fleeting moment uh, in a much larger human narrative. And so we need to move forward, yes, but while also clinging to those things that are really essential and traditional, not the things that felt good for 150 years. And you talk about that a lot in your book. I think the terms you, your, the, the metaphor that you used was the hearth and the agora. Can you talk about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I make, I mean, that's a large part of the, the argument in the book is that at least during the industrial era or, um, it was really normal to separate. Uh, the hearth and, and the agora, right? So just think of hearth as home. Just think of the agora as as work. Um, the only time in in human history where people actually went to work was the industrial era. I mean, people worked, of course, and they started to work, but they they usually worked where you lived, right? You you lived on the farm. You worked on the farm. Even if you had a had a sh a shop, you probably lived upstairs from it. This idea of going to a factory, going to an office building. Uh, of these being really separated from your everyday life is is a very modern modern concept and that feels very familiar to us because we you know we have th three four generations that have that have lived through that uh, but it's not necessarily the way things need to be and I think it's part of what scares people so much about the new digital connected technologies is that it, it just breaks that down completely right your your kids or you can be at home and still working. Right, that you can still be at work and at home at the same time. You can still be um, sort of in the safe space of the family room and also connected out to the public space at the same at the same time. Um, and, and by the way, that also works the other direction, right? When I was a kid, my my parents uh, they didn't talk all day, right? Uh, they both went to work. They didn't talk all day. And the first maybe they called if there was an emergency, and then the first time they talked, it was at the end of the day at, o o over dinner. Um, where meanwhile today partners talk all day long through text messages, right? Mm -hmm. So, so even that, even in the other direction, that that boundary is dissolved, um, and that's really disorienting because we don't know what to do. But, but if you look back at history, there has always been a hearth, and there has always been a, an agora. Especially if you if you think of these things not as home and work, but as you know, the hearth being the the thing that tethers us to whether that's family or home or history or our or our ancestry, and you think of the agora just being as sort of the public sphere, the the thing that that is not so private. If you think of it as as private and public, and so that metaphor becomes really important to me because I think we need to move away from the homework categories and think about it in a broader, more essential way. And I think those metaphors allow you to understand how home and work functioned as important spaces for our our psychological, emotional, spiritual, professional well being. Um, but that they don't necessarily always need to take the same form. During this month of planning and organization for big transitions, rhythms and routines have been absolutely essential for our physical and emotional well-being. So Green Chef nights are reliably and predictably a good night. We know the ingredients will be fresh and prepped, the instructions easy to follow, and the meal delicious. We're all still talking about last week's turkey tacos with mango chimichurri sauce, refried beans, and Monterey Jack cheese. Green Chef contributes to a healthy lifestyle with easy and delicious menus like fresh seasonal salads and grain bowls, and with over 80 weekly meal and market options, plus rotating options to suit a variety of lifestyles, whether Mediterranean, plant-based, calorie-smart, keto, protein-packed, gluten-free, there are always plenty of options to choose from. Whatever you select, you'll get farm fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins all delivered straight to your door. I love those four words, straight to my door. Oh, and one more thing I love about Green Chef, they have an app, which means it's easy to manage meal preferences and delivery from your phone if you want to. And I, for one, want to. I am in that mode where I'm making the most of little moments like waiting in line at the pharmacy or for the F train to pull into the station to tackle all of those to-dos. So the convenience of an app is key for me. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash Tilt50 and use code Tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. 
That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code TILT50 at greenchef.com slash TILT50. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. Super interesting. So the article that I had shared in my community, I think was the interview with Anya Kamenetz, who we actually have had on the podcast when her book came out um, last yeah. year. And I think the quote that I pulled specifically, you know, to highlight in my share was, how are we going to maintain those positive things, the compassion, ethics, good social skills and intimate relationships, if we're teaching them to live in a world that doesn't look like the world they're living in? And that just really, that's when I was like, okay, I got to have this guy on my podcast. You know, it really just (laughs) struck me. And is that the area of most resistance that you see among parents is just not accepting the world that we're currently living in? I mean, I want to say yes, but I also don't want to, you know, it's sort of, I I think there's a lot of rhetoric that doesn't sort of match what parents actually do. Uh, I think we like to perform this perfect, this image of a parent who's always putting a lot more restrictions than we actually are. So while yes, I think that's a problem in the way we think, I'm not sure where any of us act as, uh, as divided as it sounds. And what I mean by divided is I, I I think that quote came out of a, a discussion with, there's all this conversation about screen time, how many hours should a kid be allowed in front of a screen, all these things. And meanwhile, it's just not optional anymore, right? Like, uh, could you imagine if you had to do anything like work or your personal relationships without a phone or a computer or anything? Like, imagine have you ha- if I said you're only allowed one hour a day and you have to still make your life work. I, I don't think anyone could do that. Um, and what scares me is that kids, the message they get when we divide it into these sort of episodic moments of screen time is it it becomes this sort of temptation where none of the normal rules apply, right? It's like, oh, now you can go play freely. Uh, And that just bothers me. If if, if screens and digital technology is going to be so integrated into our lives, it already is, but it's only going to be more so than don't we want to make sure that our kids learn all the same values and behaviors that we expect of them if they're on the playground when they're also in a digital playground, right? Like they need to learn how to be respectful online. They need to learn how to... I mean, that's sort of the basic stuff when you think about trolling, like, you know, teach them don't be disrespectful, don't bully, don't cyber bully. But I even think there's more to it in terms of teach them how to how to respond and and be aware of, of difference right there's so much diversity on the on the internet right you you can be exposed to so many different things how do you start to evaluate that how do you decide how how to evaluate that respectfully how do you not make quick judgments uh, all those things are things we need to teach kids we can't just expect them to know how to do it or to just be able to apply what we teach them at the dinner table to what they do online, right? We need to we, we need to hold their hands and show them how to do that. And and there's just this sort of uh, I don't think it's happening. I, I don't I think there's sort of this you know that's that's a whole other space we're going to ignore is a lot of the you know or we're going to restrict um, is a lot of the grown up attitude to it. 
And what I see is that a lot of people restrict until their child reaches a certain age, and then they can sometimes be let off leash, right? Um, not that our kids are dogs, but you know, there, <laughs> there is this sense of, you know, when they're younger, we need to have more control. And then when they're teenagers, it's like, oh, well, that's just what teens do. And then we may totally disengage from what they're doing online. Yeah, uh, well, that's that's absolutely true. And even worse is that, I mean, actually, I mean, I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, that that is how we do so many things in life, right? We we basically hold our hand our kids' hands until we 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 feel um 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 what's the right word? We feel convinced that that, that we can trust them to make the right decisions on their own, right? When mm-hmm. they when you teach them to cross the street, you do that. When you, I mean, even even when they're really little and you take them on a playground, right? You don't you don't let them climb alone until you know they're not going to fall, right? right. Um, and, and then you still don't even let them alone into, with other kids until you know they're not going to hit, right? You, you sort of, you, 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 lo- you, you learn how, how much oversight they need at any given moment and, and you slowly want to back off. Um, that's true. But I think when it comes to screens, one of the things that bothers me is that it ought, what that often means is it, it's still this sort of time question. It's often, you know, I keep track of how many hours they're on it. But I want parents on it with the kids um, when they're little so that the kids learn to imitate mature behaviors online. So they learn to imitate ethical behaviors, not just online, I mean, in a digital world, so that they learn how to make sense of it. So they, the parents help them understand and mediate their digital experiences. And I think that there's not nearly enough of that happening uh, among the really young kids. And then, as you said, even with none of that happening, we still let them go when they become teenagers, where now they're not limited on time. They're also, uh, we also don't know whether or not they know how to make sense of it. And then we're surprised that the spaces end up full of bullying or, or racial slurs or radicalization. I mean, I, I, I don't know why we're surprised if we haven't taught kids how to deal with those kinds of things first. So you suggest that kids actually might be engaged in social media at much younger ages, you know, and if we're going to play that role of teaching them how to interact with it in a healthy way and draw those limits, what might that look like? Can you give us an example of of how to help your child at a younger age learn how to engage in social media? Yeah, well, the first thing I would say about the younger age is that when I say that I think they should engage in social media at a younger age, I don't mean like, hey, let's give them all a, a, an Instagram account at six. Okay, <laughs> that would that would that be really bad parenting, I think. Um, but what I do mean is, is get them involved in the sort of structure of social media. So, so in my perfect world, there would be, you know, maybe you have a maybe you have a large extended family full of uncles and aunts, and and you see each other uh, for holidays. Then it would be great if you had an extended family closed social network that the kids could be on because you could put up photos of Thanksgiving dinner. You could put up articles about uh, how different people in your family, uh, what they're up to, right? Things like that. And they would be able to participate and watch. And that would be great. You might also do that with a church group or with a soccer team, who knows, right? But in my perfect world, there would be closed networks that grownups and kids are in together when they're little so that they're watching us, right? So that they're, so that we're modeling behaviors for them. And, you know, I think about this all the time. I, I learned the right behavior for interacting with people from sitting at the dinner table with my brothers and my and my uncles and my aunts, right? That's how you learn how to sit at a dinner table and you learn what's okay and what's not. And you also learn things like pro-social teasing, right? Like uh, uncles and aunts often tease each other, but they do it in a way that's full of respect and love and not cruel. Um, I mean, sometimes it can be cruel, but it still, it still usually has some dignity and it, it preserved in it. Well, how do you learn to do that? Like, I'm pretty sure my kids know how to do that at a family dinner because they've watched my brothers and I do it for years. But did they ever get a chance to watch adults who are kind and compassionate start to to have sort of back and forth banter in a digital space? I don't know. I mean, most of what they see, even I who watch a lot of it, don't know what a lot of it, what's happening, right? I don't know what's going, what they're seeing on YouTube. I don't know. I mean, I, I check pretty often, but that doesn't mean I see it all. But I, I wish I could have controlled and could still control well, they're old enough now, I don't need to. But when they were little, I wish we could control how they experience it. But the real point I'm making is that they need to experience it if we want them to learn how to do it well. It can't be, hey, we need to shelter them from it, because then they turn 
teenagers and we're suddenly go now you can have an instagram account i guarantee you that if you have nobody's taught you any rules and you're suddenly full of hormones you are not going to handle that very well yeah absolutely well let's talk about video games i really enjoyed this conversation i will just say that i live with two gamers my husband (laughs) and my son my 14 year old son and you know my husband has been a gamer since you know for i've known him for 20 years that he's been gaming And so I kind of gave up the fight with my son (laughs) a long time ago. But, you know, it's been really interesting, just my personal evolution. I homeschool my son, and I used to really divide school with games or, you know, reserve games for when everything else is done. And what I, in my shift in the past few years has been seeing the way that he interacts with games, for example, a Kerbal Space Program is a game yeah. that he really likes. And I, you know, I see him kind of making these intricate spreadsheets to figure out problems that he's trying to solve to have successful missions. And I'm like, okay, that's learning. That's, you know, I'm always looking for where are the learning opportunities. And I'm, I'm always struck by how much learning is actually happening. So can you talk a little bit about what you found, how kids can benefit from video games? Yeah. I mean, you you gave a great example already. Um, I mean, the first thing I'll say is let's not overstate it, right? Because uh, a lot of people w- will ask me questions like, what are, what are the benefits of video games? And I always want to go, okay, to be clear, video games aren't broccoli. There's no like vitamins in them. <laughs> like, it's not like playing makes you better okay, <laughs> or healthy. Um, like that's not the case. But But there are plenty of things you learn through playing. I'm not sure how many of them matter other than the social skills, the problem-solving skills, the motor skills, those are all important. But I think the great thing I loved about your example is, is the spreadsheet, because most of what we do in, in education involves these sort of, um, especially in math, I use math as an example, uh, mathematicians often call them toy problems. Uh, and that can be the word problems, that can be the stuff in the workbook, but they're not based on real world data, right? They're sort of imaginary problems. You don't go, hey, I want to know when are the two trains going to meet? You don't go, well, the first thing I need to do is go online and look up the schedules, right? Instead, we get the toy, the toy example. Um, and I don't see any reason why that can't be a video game example, which is what you just gave, is why not be building mathematical spreadsheets uh, about your video game? You care about your video game. All we did was make you care. You know, th- that's how you teach. You teach by sort of, uh, they used to say when they were, when I used to do a lot about learning games, uh, people used to say, but learning, should, it shouldn't be chocolate covered broccoli. You shouldn't just give them a math test that looks like a game. And I'm like, well, no, that's okay, actually. Like most learning is chocolate covered broccoli to some extent. Like if I were to say to my kids, hey, you have to do math because one day you might need to do your taxes. They're already bored (laughs) as soon as they heard the word taxes, right? But if I say you have to do math because it's going to help you get better at this video game, well, it's also going to help them with their taxes. And that is actually an internal motivation for them because that's their world. That's what matters to them. Um, And so the more we can connect it to their world, the better. Um, That's good teaching to be able to connect it to the world. An example similar to what you what you brought up, which I think is good for parents to understand, especially I imagine part of why that happens in your household is because your husband is also a gamer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a lot of respect for the game. It's not imagined as a as this other bad thing in the house because dad also does it, right? So what that tells your son is this is something worth applying mathematical ideas to. This is something worth applying the things I'm learning to. Uh, and, and it's meaningful. I think about this with my own son. I have a son who loves to play Civilization. And I see how when he does his history homework, he's often thinking about all these questions of resources and, and how the movements went. And, and he's trying to apply what he's learned from the strategy game Civilization to his history lesson. Well, the only reason he does that is because I've encouraged that. And that's what we want them to be doing. Then they're learning from both things. They're learning ways of thinking about the game and ways of thinking about history that are both that are both super useful. Uh, but if we don't encourage that, then we have a kid who, who can't even make that connection at all who i mean they might accidentally make that connection but it's wouldn't it be better if we said every time you're playing a video game think about how it relates to the things you're learning at school right (laughs) i love that example and that's another favorite game civilization in our house (laughs) uh, by the way um but the word that jumped out at me that i think is so important is respect and i will just say you know Personally, this is something I really had struggled with because, you know, my husband has been trying to get me to play games 
since we started dating. Like <laughs> he would buy me, you know, roller coaster tycoon or, you know, just trying yeah, yeah. to lure me in. I'm like, sweetie, it's not happening. Like I am not a gamer. And I, I really don't think I respected it as a experience or, you know, a way to spend time. And that has completely changed for me. And I think our kids know when we don't respect the game and it changes how they interact with it. And just like you said, it changes how they're able to kind of recognize the value in it or feel good about the experience and get excited about applying it in in bigger ways. Yeah. And draw connections between it and the things you do care about. Um, You know, I'm glad you brought this up because uh, often I speak and, and parents go, but I don't like games. And you don't have to like it to respect it, right? You don't have to like playing to be able to show your respect for it. Um, I, you know, people hear me all the time say you should play games with your kids. And to, to be honest, I don't play games with my kids anymore. I'm uh, I'm not good enough to play with them anymore. They're, uh, they're way better than me. But I still, no matter what game they're playing, find a reason to sit down and ask them about it, to ask them how it works, to show them that it's, that one, I respect it, but then, Also, I'm modeling kinds of questions to ask. Sometimes those questions are the ones that so many of us are concerned about. Like, I'll look at what they're doing and I'll go, well, that seems kind of gross and violent. And uh, and I don't understand why it's fun to look at that kind of violence. Can you explain that to me? Uh, And again, I don't really, I'm not really worried that if they look at the violence, they're going to become sociopaths. I am worried that if they look at the violence without the capacity to reflect on it, they could. Uh, And so I spend a lot of time going, hey, let me show you that I respect what you're doing enough that I'm going to teach you what mature reflection on that activity looks like. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. If you like this show, there's a decent chance you'll also enjoy the Shameless Mom Academy. Hi, I'm Sarah Dean, the founder and host of the Shameless Mom Academy. The Shameless Mom Academy is a podcast for moms that centers moms more than it centers your kids. I'm not going to teach you how to make baby food or how to make your three-year-old or 13-year-old stop having tantrums. Instead, I'm going to bring you back to yourself. For the last 20 years, I've been helping moms through growth and transformation. Inside the Shameless Mom Academy, I help you identify who you are and who you are becoming. Look, motherhood is hard. It brought me to my knees many times and sometimes still does. Returning to who I am and who I am becoming allows me to decide how to show up in all those sticky motherhood moments, but also in all my other relationships and in all the ways I show up in my various communities. So come check out the Shameless Mom Academy wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm willing to bet you'll leave feeling a little inspired and maybe even completely fired up. And you'll probably laugh a few times because I promise we never take ourselves too seriously over here. With 700 episodes to choose from, you're likely going to find something that sparks and speaks to you inside the Shameless Mom Academy. So let's just talk about addiction. That is something I'm sure comes up a lot. You know, when you're talking to groups of parents, it comes up any conversation I have about screen time. It's a big concern for many parents about their kids potentially being addicted to 
their phones, their computers, their games. So what did you discover to be true? Or what are your thoughts on addiction in relation to how kids are interacting with technology? Uh, okay, I think there's two main points here. And one is, um, well, I, I think I'll start with with where I think the language of addiction comes from. And I'm sure you know, and I'm sure your community knows, that there's a lot of resistance to the language of addiction when it comes to screens. Um, and there's a lot of people who love to use the language. And and in the scientific community, it sort of is, is very split on whether we should be using that language or not. Um, in general, the word addiction is is already problematic in in most cases because people don't know whether it's a chemical addiction, whether it's a neurological issue. No, nobody really knows at this point. There's lots of you, there wouldn't still be writing books about it if everyone knew. But I think the way the place that that comes from is this narrative that's always sort of bothered me about the dopamine release that happens when when you're playing video games, which is a bit, um, you know, it's sort of I, I don't know who started it, but it's just, ple- you know, pleasure comes with dopamine release. Um, we, we know that. And, and there's no evidence that you get more of that playing a video game than you do from eating a hot fudge sundae. You know, but there is evidence that when it's a drug, it's like 20 to 100 times more dopamine is, is released. And that's not true with, with video games. So, so I think that's where that comes from. And I, I always like to say, hey, it, it's not doing all the things that the scare tactics make you think about. It's not rewiring brains. It's not, you know, th- that's all just language games that people are using. Yes, it probably, you know, it, well, first of all, your brains don't have wires, right? So, so it's not rewiring <laughs> anything. It's obviously a metaphor. <laughs> um, but, but even to what they mean by it, which is that the brain is changing because of it. Yeah, of course, the, the brain changes because of lots of things. Mm-hmm. But to, to make this a villain is not really accurate. Now, on to the straight addiction question, because there's certainly parents who see children who can't put down their phones, who have who who can't stop playing video games, who have uh, unbelievably violent reactions if the if they can't play a video game, who who have things that sort of look like typical withdrawal symptoms. To that, I would say, it's, uh, you know, I've heard so many of these stories. Um, I think I, I am very concerned about them. It is absolutely possible to develop a very unhealthy relationship with a digital device. We, we've seen that. Um, two ways I deal with that once that happens is either um, my whole message is that, is that we need to start much younger in making sure we teach kids how to develop healthy relationships with their devices so that we don't get to the place that we see so many teenagers in right now and young people in, right? I'm, that's part of why I say, hey, get involved younger, model these things younger, because right now we're, we're sort of painting it as a temptation. Um, we're painting it as the evil temptation. And of course, if they behave with it the way they would behave with an evil temptation when you paint it that way. So that attitude needs to change. As to the kids who do develop these really unhealthy relationships, one of the things that scares me about that is that it's possible to develop unhealthy relationships with anything, right? You can develop an unhealthy relationship with food, uh, sex, money, work. We, you know, I know lots of adults who have all of those kinds of unhealthy relationships. And if there's one thing we know in psychology, it's that those unhealthy relationships are often the result of other issues, whether it's trauma or a confidence issue or a self-worth question, right? There, there's so much that underlies those kinds of unhealthy relationships. And what I would like to see when they happen is that I, I would hope that parents give their kids all the love and support and professional help they need in order to get to the root of what that problem is. Because I get really scared that if we scapegoat the video games, we haven't solved the actual problem that led to that unhealthy relationship in the first place. And, and that's what we really need to worry about. That's such a good point. I don't think I've ever heard it stated that way, that we do tend to villainize technology and phones and and screens. And yeah, it's always because there's something else going on. It could, you know, would they say that all behavior is communication? So what is that communicating to us about what the child's experiencing? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's a symptom of something deeper. And yeah, we often do, you know, we need to address the symptom and the way to address the symptom might be a kind of video game rehab or whatever, but you still haven't addressed the problem. Right. I'm going to ask you this question and this may not be part of your research, but I know my audience is probably thinking this question right now. So I'm going to ask it. One of the things that many of the families in my community whose kids might have, you know, ADHD or attention learning issues or executive functioning challenges, 
that they are concerned that their child's relationship with their screens might contribute to those executive functioning challenges. And I'm just wondering, did you find any link to that or or stumble upon any interesting research as you were writing this book about that connection? Well, again, it's not, it's not really my field, but I will say I've seen a, quite a bit of research about it. It usually suggests that it goes the other way, though, right? That ADHD, for example, leads to excessive interest in screens, not the other way around. And that I, I don't know if it worsens things. I don't even know if it's possible to worsen things, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, look, I, I think to me, when I think about this question, and again, I'm doing this without a lot of knowledge about the specific issues that your community faces. But I would still say that every kid is different and everyone needs to figure out what's best for that particular child. And um, I'm sure there are cases where the screen and the devices are in the way of starting to learn habits and behaviors and patterns that are better for for the individual child. And in that case, then we certainly need to intervene. Um, But then I think there's times when it's not. And the idea to think that this technology is always one or the other, uh, I think is, is, is just problematic. It might be the only thing that gives your child comfort in between all the other important therapies they're doing, for example, in which case, why would you want to take that away from them? Right. <laughs> you talk about that in your book, you know, you talk about stuffies and, you know, and, and that technology as being not a security blanket, but something that can help kids feel more, you know, kind of at home or more connected at a time when they might be feeling isolated or confused about who they are. Yeah, well, that came out of I was on a I was traveling with my kids. And at first, I was really frustrated because they were always on looking at their smartphones playing games while we were traveling. And I go, why are you doing that? Can't you know, look around, you've never been here. Don't you want to see don't you want to observe things? And then it sort of, you know, I took the devices away, of course, it was a mistake, but I did. And the way I knew it was a mistake was was I discovered when they didn't have them, they immediately got homesick. And so I had to find a balance because, the, of course, we could be traveling. And once they're playing a game, they would stay in the hotel room all day and not do anything, <laughs> right? Um, because Partially because there's ang- it's anxiety. It's different. You know, think about how scared you are if you're in a foreign city. Imagine if you're a kid and you're not even the one like who knows how to get on the subway, right? Mm-hmm. You have to be, someone has to lead you to everything. So, so I think it makes sense that that's frightening to them. But so I have to say, stop. No, you can't stay in the hotel room and play on your phone all day. But, but I also don't want to say, hey, you can't play on your phone at all because I've recognized that the phone gives them comfort. What I've tended to do now that I've realized this as I've gotten older is talk to them, uh, try to, what's the right word? Think of ways, creative ways to get them to be doing both at the same time. So I'll say things like, don't you want to take a picture of that for Instagram? So I'm sort of encouraging them to be present with whatever the the sightseeing thing we're doing is while also allowing them to use their phone as a way to get more present with it. And I think that puts it, allows it to be this transitional object that helps them deal with being in a foreign place, but also f- being in a comfort, a comfortable space at the same time. And that's a good thing. I mean, you know, we like to think that when we're traveling and we all take Instagram pictures, we're just try- showing off. But I think we're also trying to stay connected to an anchor, to, to what I call the, the hearth, right, to, to our communities. Like we want to share with them because we want we, we, it, it makes us feel like we're not so alone and so isolated and so far away. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah, that really, I had never thought of it that way. And and it made total sense when I read that story. And I think that's something all of us listening can relate to. So okay, before we say goodbye, for parents who are listening to this, and they want to stop either fighting their child's use of screens, or just form a more healthy relationship with how their child interacts with technology, any strategies or, or suggestions for things parents can think about changing? Yeah, well, the first thing I would say is um, you said for parents who are tired of fighting, and I, I like to point out to parents all the time that, like, if you're tired of fighting, sorry, you know, this part of parenting, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not always fun. If kids always did the right thing without you having to nag them, then they wouldn't need their parents, right? Uh, so, so don't expect everything to be calm all the time, um, or even that it's going to make everything easy. 
but to the second part about how do, how do you change the attitude so that you're not fighting a screen? I, I have no problem if you're fighting your child to make sure your child goes to bed at a reasonable hour. I just don't want you fighting a screen to make sure your bed your child goes to bed at a reasonable hour. And to do that, I think I would start by saying uh, start immediately, like whatever it is that your child is so obsessed with on that screen sit down with them and go, show it to me. I want to understand it. Explain it to me. Uh, and, and while they're explaining it to you, don't be afraid to, to share your honest opinions with it. I so often tell my kids that I don't like what they're doing or that I find it stupid. Um, but I do that with respect and with love, right? The same way I would tell a friend that, right? I, I don't say, hey, you can't do it. I go, why would you like that? That that seems problematic to me. That seems gross to me. That seems dumb to me. That's that's not my kind of humor. I, I'm not 12, year old, 12 years old anymore. Penis jokes aren't funny to me anymore, <laughs> right? Like, um, uh, well, some of them are, but, but, <laughs> but, but just saying the word isn't funny to me me anymore. <laughs> um, but say I say that to my kids all the time. And so asking them what it is and then having that real engagement with it, all you're doing is modeling for them the capacity to have that critical engagement themselves, right? When they're watching YouTube videos, I often say to my kids, who's paying for this, right? Did the video game pay for them to make that? Is it like, or is it the console? Mm -hmm. Somebody must pay them. They're not doing it for free. And, and then I overhear them doing the same thing to their to their friends, right? They become the iconoclast going, this isn't, this isn't and that's that's great to me. And, and all that is, is me sitting down going, I'm willing to have the same conversation with you about this that I'd have about anything. I, I don't see this as something frivolous. I see this as something worthy of our conversation, worthy of our reflection, and worthy of a critical perspective. Um, and, and so I would encourage parents to just do that immediately. You don't have to like the game. You don't have to want to play it. But just ask your kids what it is they like, why they like it, what's good, what's bad, what makes you good, what makes you bad, what is that, you know, you may see a crazy goblin, what's that crazy goblin, why is it a goblin? Um, for a long time, we talked about, it's changed, but I remember the, uh, years ago having conversations with my kids who were even really little about how come all the... Uh, all the heroes in the games were always white men. We had lots of conversations about that. And th that's changed a lot since, since those early days. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was true once. And that, just that discussion about representation is, is a way of taking something seriously um, and taking what your kids do seriously and, and showing that it's worthy of that and not just kid stuff. Awesome. So much food for thought. I really appreciate you um, just sharing all this with us today. And I'd be very curious to hear what kind of feedback I get on this episode as well. Because there's a lot of fear, a lot of insecurity, and shame even, you know, around uh, parents who are maybe more permissive with screen time rules, or maybe they don't have guidelines, and then they feel the judgment from parents who do. It is, it's a contentious uh, subject. So yeah, and there's a lot of, I mean, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because there is a lot of judgment. And, and I kept talking to parents and I went, wait a second, kids are using screens more than anyone is admitting. Parents are okay with it way more than they're saying. And they don't have permission to say that. And I, if anything ha good comes out of this book, it's that I, I hope that parents end up feeling like they're allowed to have their own opinion about this and not just and not just a, bl a black or white opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, hopefully, you know, this is part of the conversation and, and spreading it. And I think it's it's important to be talking about these issues because the world is changing. This is the future. <laughs> There is no exactly future. The present, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. So anyway, super interesting. I really enjoyed this conversation. And if listeners want to engage with you on social media um, or otherwise uh, connect with your work, how do they do that? Well, the best way is to get is to get me on Twitter. I'm I'm at Jordosh, J O R D O S H. Um, and then you can also, if you want to engage with me or email or something, you can go to www.thenewchildhood.com, and uh, there's lots of different ways to get in touch with me there. Excellent. And listeners, as always, I will include links to Jordan's book and all of his social media handles on the show notes page as well. So if you didn't write that down, you're in the car, you can go check that out later. So Jordan, thank you so much again. Super interesting conversation. I really enjoyed learning more about your work. And I look forward to seeing what's next for you. Thank you so much. And uh, it's such a pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to speak to your whole community. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. 
For the show notes for this episode, visit tiltparenting.com slash podcast and search for this conversation. If you like what you heard on today's episode, I would be grateful if you could take a minute to head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a rating or a review. Thank you so much for helping us stay visible so people who would benefit from the show can easily find it. If you want to support the show and help me cover the cost of production, please consider joining my Patreon campaign. To support the show, just visit patreon.com slash tilt parenting. Lastly, if you aren't already part of the online community at Tilt, I invite you to sign up at tiltparenting.com on the box in the bottom where it says join the revolution. Every Thursday, I send out a short email with a quick note for me, a link to that week's podcast episode, and links to five stories from the news that week that are relevant to parents like us. Again, you can sign up and learn more about Tilt at www.tiltparenting.com. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast.